So with that now we confirm the position and the preload on the pinion. That didn't work well. My press just reaches the limit. One of these days, maybe tomorrow, I can go to my friend Eugene's place. He has multiple presses. I believe his biggest one is 50 ton. <laughs> All right, we are at Eugene's shop again. And if you remember last summer, at some point we picked up his GT6 and he's been slowly, slowly working on it. But you can see his shop is packed with tools and stuff and he's so busy, he just bought a plasma cutter with, uh, with an arm. It's a CNC arm, it's not with uh, the gantry stuff. So he's been cleaning the motor here a little bit, but he's busy, he goes to work every day even though he's 74 I think and he does a lot of work at home as well so he's been doing a little bit of work on his GT6 and he's finally agreed to show up in camera too so <laughs> here he is he's setting up this little press do you think this is gonna be big enough <laughs> how many tons is this press 50, 50 tons oh my god <laughs> okay watch out <laughs> so yeah we had to come here to pull these out because my press which Eugene gave me he gave it to me for free but it's not big enough so now I have to bother him with his other one okay let's set up and we're gonna bring you back show sure. yeah that's a four thousand dollar thing oh my god <laughs> I, I didn't pay it uh, I was given them after I did a whole bunch of repairs. Somebody them. gives you stuff as well? <laughs> you know, there's this guy that gives me tools all the time. <laughs> Every time I live here, I live with full tank of tools. Oh, uh, not quite this time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> Scared the crap out of me again. Well, that's why I like it this way because. Uh, yeah, you can stay away from stay, it. I've got around the corner before. <laughs> the worst I ever had was taking an axle off uh, a grader okay. out in the bush. Oh. By the railroad tracks. Yeah. And uh, I had a hydraulic thing on it, and two I got it on the other side to pull the uh, hub off the axle okay. and then put the new one on. And to get it back on tight, we drove it in a circle for an hour. <laughs> Tighten it up, drove it in a circle. Tighten it up, drove it in a circle. Well, the things we the, figure the, out, you know? They were the... Yeah, I did this for I could get the maximum stroke. Yeah, out of it, eh? yeah that's I made perfect. This. I made it. <laughs> A 50 ton press. Great. Well, thank rebuilt you. It. Got the cylinder for nothing, rebuilt it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, on new jeans press, we didn't push them all the way out. We only loosened the nut by quarter inch, maybe, or three eighths, just so we can push the flange a little bit out on the taper, just so it can loosen. But we didn't want the parts to fly all over the place, so that's why we kept the nut on. And I thought that I was going to be able to push the rest by hand because once the taper releases, I should be able to. Okay. But uh, it was still tight. I guess the wood roof key was keeping it. That's why I needed to finish pushing them out on my press. Let's clean this now. So this is where the seal leaves. So we're going to take it out. And this is the bearing that needs to be pushed out this way. So. We're gonna clean everything first and then we're gonna take the bearing out as well. All right, the key stayed inside, the wood roof key. That's fine, we don't need to take it out. This is the sealing surface. This is what writes on the seal. So we're gonna polish it a little bit. It's not. Horrible. I mean, it's not a nail catcher, 
but it would be great if we can polish it a little bit. So a little bit of WD-40 on a 600 grit sandpaper. And Okay, that looks good now. There are some dots here and there, but it is much better than what it was initially. All right, now let's push the bearing out. Okay. And here is this little shoulder that doesn't allow the bearing to come out this way i believe in other diffs this shoulder was bigger but doesn't really matter okay now as we're here we can push the new one in do it the same way then we'll put this here we're going to put this backwards. This shoulder is so small that I'm afraid that if I push too hard, it's going to go past. <laughs> no, it won't. Okay, this is assembled. Now let's do our seal. So we have a wider flange here and narrower here. The narrower one goes in. The seal needs to be flush with the wider one. So I'm going to go take it out. So the, the wider one is up, the seal goes with the open part down towards the oil. And this, this. Okay, perfect. And now we are ready to assemble. Now we can assemble it. this and now we can put our axle our shaft in we have to match of course the wood roof key which is still there there you go <coughs> then the washer well you know what first we're gonna start with the nut only for a second just to push it enough so we can put the washer That's enough for now. We're gonna torque them later. All three flanges we're gonna torque later. So that's it. This is ready to go in. In the previous episode, we took care of the pinion. So in this episode, we're gonna put this to the side and we're gonna take care of our carrier. <laughs> so from the carrier, I already have one of these bearings taken out because uh, we figured that one of the shells was bad. I think not this one. It was the one on the other side. If you see here, it has developed some cancer right here. So we decided that we're gonna change these two bearings. That wasn't in the plans initially. We weren't gonna change those. But since one was bad, we decided to change both. So I took this side out already because i wanted to give the numbers to the owner and apparently the cone and the race are two separate part numbers so they come they come separately so anyways um we have to replace this but replacing this means that we have to rearrange the shims probably i mean these shims so you see we have a whole bunch of shims here between the cone and the carrier and we have the same here so these shims determine the preload on the two bearings when it is put inside the housing but they also determine the position of the carrier relative 
relative to the bearings. So we can put more shims on this side and less shims on this side, that's going to move the carrier to the left. If we put more shims here and less there, that's going to move it to the right. So first of all, we have to determine the preload, which is the total amount of shims that we're going to have to use. And then we have to decide how many of them to use on the right and how many on the left. You know what I mean? So we're going to take care of that. But first, I want to make sure also that we don't have any play here inside. Inside here, we should have zero backlash. If we need to adjust the shims here as well, we have to do that first. So if there's backlash here, you can take everything apart and add more shims so the gears get squished together, right? So here we don't have any play, so we're not going to go there. Now, we have to take out the other bearing as well. First of all, because we have to replace it, but also to be able to determine how many shims we have there, we have to assemble it first without shims. Also, we're going to have to remove all these bolts now because we have to remove the crown from here in order to determine the... We'll, you will see what I'm talking about. Um, I'm assuming this is marked somewhere because we want to put it in the exact same position after. But I'm going to check. I don't see any marks anywhere though. No, it is not marked. That's why we're going to mark it. Okay, I think that's enough. Yeah, just making sure that there's no play there, which there isn't. Okay, so next we need to pull out this bearing from here so let me set up for that and I'll bring you back so now to pull the bearing out there's these notches here where eventually if you have a small jaw puller it, you can fit one here and one here grab it and pull it but mine is not that small and I think I have a smaller one somewhere just that I can't find it so I'm gonna use my bearing spreader i believe it's called which uh, we have to be careful though we have to put it under the race here you see there's very little distance i mean this bearing is coming out anyways we're gonna replace it but later we're gonna have to put on and off the new ones and we don't want to ruin them so we have to be very careful not to pull by the cage here because we're gonna ruin the, ruin the bearing we need to put it under the race and then for the center here, I made this stack of washers that I had to machine a little bit because they were too big with a bolt with a hole in the head. So I put it like this and that gives me the possibility here to put my jaw puller. All right, so here we have only shims but like I said it doesn't really matter how much we have because now we're gonna have to measure everything so I'm just gonna put them together with the other ones all right so now I just checked here there was a little bit of burr from my bearing spreader so I cleaned it up because we need to have a perfectly smooth surface here right otherwise we're not gonna have the correct measurement clean the burr and now we can install the bearings on both sides without any shims. And the shims are coming later. And I'm hoping that I should be able to tuck them in instead of pressing them in because, because they need to come out after, right? So the Tinkin reference for this bearing is 16150. So let's see if it is going to go easy. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to put anything on top and tap it because it turns out the cage is higher than the bearing, so we don't want to do that. Looks like we're gonna have to press it in, which means it's gonna be tight to come out after. But 
is what it is. We need to do it. Let's go on the press. Okay, we make sure that it bottoms out. Yes, you're right. We can put it on the bearing now. Well, we can put one of these underneath, right? That's gonna sit like that. Okay. So now we can bring our case and we're gonna do a test dry assembly. Now we're gonna take the new shells. So this is 16284. This is 16283. So I don't know. I hope they are the same. But we will see. I'm just gonna put these away so I don't mix them up. Now without the shims, I'm hoping that we're gonna be able to drop it in without spreading it. But later with the shims we're gonna have an issue putting it in because remember how, how it was jammed in and I just pried it out? Well, now we have to be careful how we're putting it in. For that, I made this spreader that we're gonna use later, but for now, I'm pretty sure we don't need it. So, let's take the other one. Just in case, you know, I don't want this to fall on my toes. So, one bearing goes on this side, the other one goes on this side. And let's see if we can drop it in now. There you go. Okay. Lots of room. I'm afraid we might need to have more shims. Like definitely we will need more shims than what we have now. Wow, wow, wow. So that's the difference. This is 16284, this is 16283, and I guess the difference is in the width here. And that's why we have this problem. I'm pretty sure the inner I'm pretty sure the inner one is the same. 16150. So the new one is 16150 as well. So the inner part is the same what is different you see this here so the cone is the same and the angle is the same it this shell it has a little bit more of a thickness here that is not used by the rollers it's just wider pam, pam, pam. so what we're gonna have to do is measure the new one 624 and subtract it from the old one, 746, 624, so that's 76 plus 46 is 122, right? Let me see if I zero this here. Zero it here. 124, correct. 124 is our difference and I have 80 tau spacers that I can use so that's too much okay let me think about it all right so I went on the lathe and turned one of these because I have lots of these hold on I had five of these so I took one and I turned it into this which is now about 40 something tau but when we add it to one of the standard ones that we have this equals 120 930 tau and we wanted 124 right but i want it to stay this way that's going to ensure that i have to remove some of these shims i don't have to add because i don't have any by leaving this a little bit thicker we're going to have to remove some of these so anyways now i have to go and make one more of these and then take two more and turn the inner diameter out because you see the inner diameter needs to be bigger and the outer diameter doesn't really matter actually i turned this one a little bit down but it doesn't really matter because it's uh, it's between the bearing and the thing it doesn't really matter there so we're gonna add this 
underneath the bearing, right? So that's going to push the bearing out, which means that the bearing is going to come out here a little bit more. But I checked and we have more than enough room because this bearing hits this surface here, right? So we have a gap in between the two bearings. So we are good here. No problem that the bearing is moving a little bit out. All right, I let the owner know what's going on here and he's gonna call the bearing supplier that he bought these from just to confirm that these bought are a match for the cones that we have because the cones are 16150, the new ones and the old ones. So as long as the new cones are a match with uh, this new race that is narrower, we can make it work with the shims, but we want to make sure that this is not a horrible mistake that we are making because this is part number 16283, the old one, and the new one is 16284, which I'm assuming is the same, just the width is different, but let's confirm that. All right, so it's the next day. Yesterday I cleaned the gasket surfaces here. I even took out the rear housing, cleaned that. Even these I cleaned, remarked them so we don't lose the marks. These I showed you already, but we haven't heard from the owner yesterday. So we went ahead and we did a little bit of work on this baby, which I'm probably gonna show you a video of it. She is beautiful, isn't she? Anyways, um, so today is, uh, it's almost noon and we just heard from the owner and he said, let's go ahead and make spacers so we can space these bearings out and be able to continue assembling it. So let's go do that. So we made three more, two wide and two narrow ones. So now we have two packs here, Oops. like this. So let's measure them, 129 and 129. They are a little bit thicker than what the difference between the old and the new bearing is but this only means that we're gonna have to install less of these later so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna remove these again we're gonna install our packs so we can space the bearings out which is gonna bring us to the original position of the bearings with no shims right and then we're gonna do the whole procedure and we're gonna see how many of these we need to add and on which side so here we have one of the narrow ones one of the wide ones or thin or thick whatever you want to call that and let's press this in now and then here we have the other set All right, and now we can continue with what we started yesterday, right? Turn this the other way. That's how it goes. And now we am gonna drop it inside. Oh, okay, that's better now. So now we have to measure the end play here. But the problem is, these are cones, so I'm going to measure it two different ways. We're going to put the dial gauge and we're going to measure with the dial gauge, but then I also want to reconfirm that with, um, we're going to put uh, filler gauges behind one of these and see if that shows us the same results. Yeah, that's going to be tricky because now you see here, it's not exactly zero, but doesn't matter because look, that it goes like this 
but if I push more, it moves more because now it goes inside the cone there. And if I push this way, I can go past zero. Thirty-three and nine on this side. So that's total of forty-two tau, right? Okay, that's not very accurate, I think. So we're gonna go with the filler gauge and double check. The thing is, we need to be quite perpendicular here, right? We don't want to pull only one side. We need to go all the way. So what Ed did on the Bullfire website, he took apart his gauges. So that's 25 and 17. So let's shove them in there. Oh, that's pretty tight actually. No, that's very tight. Let's go 10. So that's 25 and 10, 35. Mm. Okay. Now there's no end play. And this feels pretty good, actually. Let me show you a closer look. So now I can move them back and forth, but I feel resistance. So we are good, I think. <coughs> we have zero end play. I'm gonna check again with the dial gauge. See, I can move it three tau by hand. So I'm gonna go back to the 13 leaf here. That's definitely too tight. I'm gonna go with 12, 25 and 12. Okay, that went in, but it's super tight. Can't even move the, yeah, I can move it, but it's super tight. But let me see now if I can move it here still. No, now I can't move it here in any direction okay one last try guys with 11 that was 12 and 25 that's gonna be 11 and 25 mm. okay still tight can i move it now no no i think 10 and 25 was the best fit And now I can move it a little bit. Well, you know what? Okay, so let's consider it 25 and 11, 36. It's okay, 36 it is. Okay, so we have 36 tau of end play here, so we need a total pack total shim pack of 36 tau and what do we have here these are the original shims so we have 65 here let's measure somewhere else yeah 65 okay so we're gonna remove some to get them to 36 but let's now figure out how many we have to put on each side. 
So for this reason we have to take it out now and install the crown. So I matched the marks here and now we have to torque this to 46 foot pounds, all of them. And what I forgot to tell you is that uh, to the 36 thou of end play that we have, that we just measured, we need to add 3 thou for preload. So when we are putting it in actually, we're going to have to make it tighter. We don't want it to be zero clearance, we want it to be actually negative 3 clearance. We want it to have 3 thou of preload, so we're going to do that. So in fact we should have a total pack of shims of 39 tau. And now we're going to put it back in again without shims. That's every time. Now what we have to do is we have to measure again the end float, but this time we are measuring only between when the crown hits the pinion and this end. We're basically measuring only what needs to come here on this side. You know what? 17 is good. 17 is good. So 17 tau basically gives zero clearance between the pinion and the crown but we want to have 5 tau clearance there that's by the spec so from 17 we're going to subtract 5 so we need to have 12 tau of shims here let's try that so if we put the 12 here now in theory we should have 5 tau clearance here can't really see it but i can feel it okay so um, that's what's going to be 12 tau on this side and the rest which is 22 right 12 oops almost 12 plus 27 right makes 39 okay this is our 27 pack Okay, 12 and a half. Okay, that's our 12 pack. That goes on the short side, right? Okay, let's take this out now again. One last time, now we have to take the bearings out again so we can put our shims. All right, so this is the 12 tau side, right? So the 12 tau shims come here and we have to go to the press again. Make sure that it's bottomed out. All right, and this is our 27 shim pack. Time to install it in the housing now. All right, but now as expected, with our preload, we're not going to be able to put the carrier inside. So let's just for fun try. If it goes in, then there's something wrong. No. So this is good. <laughs> what we were supposed to do from the very beginning, when we were taking it apart, we're going to use we're gonna use the spreader that I made. So basically, you see how it works. These are actually my homemade um, spring compressors that I made seven, eight years ago. I don't remember how long ago. And that was stupid of me because many people told me at the time that's not safe. And I said, nah, it's fine. Well, never had accidents with them, but wasn't really safe so <laughs> not i'm never gonna use them as uh, spring compressors again anyways 
so I just welded them to these pieces of metal here and now we're gonna bolt them here and now by tightening these nuts we're gonna be able to spread a little bit the housing okay let's not overdo it It needs very little, apparently. That's what they say. So let's try. Almost a little bit more. Engaged with the pinion, and now we can loosen this and take it out. Now, unfortunately, I don't feel the backlash anymore, and we need to have between four and six tau of backlash here. <sighs> Which means that we need to move the whole carrier away from the pinion, it needs to come this way. So we need to take out one shim from here and move it to the other side. Oh my God, the whole procedure again. Right, just like that, we have our backlash back. Good, but now we're gonna put the caps on, we're gonna torque them, and then we're gonna measure it precisely. And then there's one more step, <laughs> which is very important actually. We're gonna check the gear pattern. The We're gonna get there. They should be marked as well here, supposedly, but I don't see any marks on the housing. So good thing we marked them before. So we put the R on the outside and the L on the outside here. So that's how they go. Okay, and good. The cap falls right on top of the bearing. I was concerned that it's not gonna hold on the whole bearing. It fits right on top of it. The torque here is 38 foot pounds. Let's see if I can hold it with my hand you hear my birds yeah I love where my shop is it's in the literally in the forest good that's three tile you know what? I'm gonna leave it. it. Needs to be four to six. I'm gonna leave it at three. That's perfect. Now, the most important part though is to check the gear mesh to see where the meshing between the gears happen, whether it's on top of the tooth, the bottom of the tooth. There's like a ton of terms here that, that we need to learn. There's a toe, there's a heel, there's a coast side, there's a drive side, there's a face and there's a root. So <laughs> all these terms, um, I don't think we're going to go through everything here. There's so many videos about that, but um, we're going to use some of them anyways. All right, so to check the pattern, what you usually use is gear marking compound. And you mark four or five teeth on the crown. And then you put a little bit of, not a little bit actually, a lot of bit of pressure on the carrier and then you turn the pinion 
and you make sure that the marked area of the crown goes through the pinion multiple times in both directions and then you check the marked teeth and you can clearly see where exactly the teeth of the pinion and the crown contact. And there are multiple charts on internet that you can see and it tells you if they contact in one end this means that your pinion is too deep, if they contact in the other end this means your pinion is too far out, etc. etc. But I don't have the marking compound so I tried to, to use multiple different things like uh, white lithium grease, uh, assembly glue, even my favorite uh, Permatex for my gasket or copper anti seize and with all these I got the same results which were a little bit weird because I, I couldn't find anywhere in the charts a pattern like mine. Mine was always showing that the entire tooth is contacting which is basically impossible. So after multiple trials, I decided to give up this idea and order the proper stuff, which was going to take a few days. So I decided to take the risk and assemble everything that I can, except the rear cover, and then check the gear pattern the proper way with the proper uh, marking compound later. All right, so now we have to assemble the shafts, the axle shafts. Here, there's no gasket. I used to put Permatex there for my gasket, my favorite one, but I think it works best with paper gaskets. This one here, since there's no gasket, I think I'm going to use, again, it's by Permatex, but I'm just going to use this for my gasket sealant, whatever it is. And the most important is around here, the perimeter of the circle. We don't need a whole bunch, we just need very little. This is our right side. We're gonna take the one that we marked with R. We changed the seal and the bearing, so we're good. It almost slips all the way in. I don't think this plate has orientation. It's always sticking up a little bit on top on the Spitfire and GT6 it has orientation, here it doesn't. All right, here we have a torque setting of 20 foot-pounds, but you can't put a torque wrench there. It doesn't really matter, I mean 20 foot-pounds is... you can feel it when your elbow clicks. That's 19, 20, okay? I'm just gonna put the cover on with two bolts. And on the bottom, that's the top. The cover has this uh, cotter pin here in this hole, which is actually a vent, because if you build up too much pressure inside, because the oil warms up, and of course, everything that warms up expands and creates internal pressure, and this needs to be vented, this pressure needs to be vented from here, otherwise you might start blowing oil through the gaskets and through the seals so that's why you have that uh, vent there and you need to make sure that it is always clean so i'm just gonna put two bolts here to hold it in place i ordered gear marking compound and when it comes we're gonna check it i spoke to the owner to the owner he's not in a hurry i just want to check it with the proper stuff so now though as it's assembled we can torque these two flanges but we still can't torque this one because um, the owner has the front plate for here the nose plate as they call it and for that plate to be installed we need to remove the flange again so that's when we're going to install the seal as well because that's the only seal that we haven't changed yet and we're going to install the plate and we're going to torque all flanges so for now this is where we're going to leave it so i'll see you in a few days well, for you it's going to be a second, but for me it's going to be a few days. Alright, it's a few days later and we finally have the correct stuff here. Gear marking compound by AC Delco. So we're going to do it the same way, like the last trial. I don't know how much of that I'm going to show you, because I did like thousands of different trials with different 
compounds in different degrees actually. I think that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna put a towel and we're gonna spin it with yeah, this way. And we're gonna have tension yellow, yellow. Anybody hear me? Yellow, yellow. <laughs> yeah, I see why this is important. It discovers so nicely. Okay, so let's go in the direction of rotation first, which is this way. Keeping here as tight as I can in the back. Okay. Now let's go back to mark the other side. One is coast side, one is uh, right side, drive side. So we don't know which one is which, but ah, now actually I even made another mark here. That's not where we marked, but it also shows here what's going on. I'm gonna go one more time, just in case. Okay, now we can see pretty clear here. Nice. All right, so I am, to be honest, I'm pretty happy with this pattern. So, from what I read and from my research, the pattern needs to be either centered in the tooth lengthwise or closer to the bottom end, but not higher to this end. I think this is called heel and this is called toe, but don't quote me, I'm, I'm not really sure. But they say that it needs to be co closer to this side then to this side which it is on all three teeth and this i believe this side is the drive side so this is where they mesh when we're driving forward the other side is the coast side so this side is pretty good it's also centered height wise in the tooth it's not too far up and it's not far, too far down it is perfectly centered i think it's good so I like this side and let's look at the other side. I believe this is the post side and it's pretty much the same. All right, so I'm looking at these patterns here and these are all acceptable patterns. These show that the pinion is too sh shallow. This is pinion is too deep. So I was looking at uh, these two, so this one where we're close to the toe so apparently toe is close to the center so this is toe this is heel so this is the drive side and this is the coast side and what we have here is we have clo closer to the toe but it is pretty much centered on the tooth it's not coming out of the tooth the pattern and on the coast side is the same it's close to the toe, but it's not coming out of the tooth, up towards the face. So I was looking at this one. This one is close to the toe, but it shows that it, it's coming out of the face here on the drive side, which for us it isn't. So I think we have this one actually. So it is close to the toe on both sides and it is coming out of the toe but apparently that's acceptable so yeah this is where we're gonna leave it i think this is our pattern so i'm gonna clean up i'm gonna put the gasket and we're done all right i cleaned it up as much as i could but the thing is, there's uh, still compound on the pinion, 
so I wipe it but then when it makes one turn <laughs> it keeps coming out but um, it's, it's not much and I'm pretty sure that this compound is designed so it doesn't contaminate the oil all right so I just installed the seal here and we can put the flange back but we can't torque it yet because here we need to have the plate but like I said I don't know if I mentioned before the owner took it to me rusty the owner took it to paint it so I'm just gonna put the nut the washer and the nut here and we're gonna leave it loose so eventually he's gonna install it himself and he needs to torque this nut to 120 foot pounds apparently or maybe he's gonna bring the plate when he comes to pick it up and I can quickly install it and torque it we will see but here again I installed my lever so I can torque the side at least so these according to the spec as well they need to be torqued to 120 foot pounds All right, and with that, we can consider the differential rebuild completed. If you're, cu if you're curious to know, it took me 12 hours in total, and that's only the rebuilding process. I mean, making the shims, fitting it multiple times on and off, replacing shims and stuff like that, to making part was separate. But yeah, it was an interesting project. I haven't done that before. I haven't been that deep into a differential before, and I wasn't very familiar with all the processes that were involved, but before I started, of course, I read a lot and I um, figured it out. Thanks to Ed Holin uh, for his article, not only about differential, it's like so many articles, guys. Uh, just find his website, Bullfire. It is like super helpful if you're restoring a TR6 or GT6. Everything is very well organized and uh, documented so thanks Ed without your article I was gonna be in uh, a lot more trouble I guess but that helped me a lot anyways guys uh, I hope that helps you now and you know what's involved in this uh, in this kind of jobs and uh, I'm sure I'm gonna be going back to this video and re-watching it in the future that's what I do <laughs> when I have to do a project I go and re-watch my videos from the past when I've done the same project just to see what uh, problems I had and how I solved them and I helped myself too so <laughs> anyways that's it guys thanks for watching thanks for commenting subscribing sharing and supporting the channel if you want to support the channel a little bit there's ways described in the description of this video there's patreon there's paypal for one-time donations if you want to or you can even go and buy merchandise from uh, my online store that's also a big help but even if you just uh, like and subscribe and share even that is a big help for me so thank you for that guys so stay tuned for more on other projects and uh, and i'll see you in the next one bye